Hey guys, Justin here. Today I want to talk about some misconceptions that some other racers may have about oval racing. I found that these days there aren't that many outright haters of oval racing anymore, but there are a lot of people just curious about it. So I wanted to talk about some things about oval racing that don't seem obvious at first glance or don't even seem intuitive to other types of racers. The first thing is the usage of brakes on ovals. Now a lot of people's exposure to oval and NASCAR racing as a whole comes from super speedways where everyone's just flat out, there's drafting, but that's really a different type of racing than standard oval racing and short tracks. What a lot of people don't understand is that on these tracks that you're not just flat out the entire time, the brakes are not only used to slow down, but to rotate the car as well and help the car turn. Oval stock cars are boats on wheels. They need all the help they can get turning, and that is why I argue that trail braking, as road racers like to call it, or I just like to call it brake dragging, is more important on ovals than it is in road in some cases. Because every straightaway on oval is a relatively long straightaway, oval racing disproportionately rewards exit speed compared to other types of racing. This phenomenon will lead to a lot of the things that I talk about, including using the brakes. So at a lot of the mile and a half tracks, such as Texas or Charlotte, you don't have to use the brakes at all on the lap. You could just let off, let the car ride for a bit, and then get back on the throttle. But because the car needs that rotation early and needs to get on the gas as long as possible, using the brakes becomes optimal at pretty much every track that's not a super speedway. A lot of first time oval racers will approach a larger track like Charlotte and not use the brakes because in their head they say, oh, if I'm not using the slow pedal, then I'll go faster. And it's very surprising when people learn that going fast actually means using the brakes in most situations. Another thing that new oval racers discover when they try it out in iRacing is where the difficulty in oval racing really comes from. It's no secret that the initial learning curve of learning an oval track is much smaller than a road course, but the difficulty comes from different places, especially in the race itself. There is very little downtime in between corners, which leads to oval racing being a type of event where you are mentally drained, your arms could be tired if you have high force feedback, and you could be racing side by side or close to other cars for the entirety of the race. It almost becomes more of a mental battle than a physical battle of sorts. And on top of that, at higher levels, you have to drive with a precision that reaches close to perfection within a couple hundredths per a given corner. But how does one even reach perfection in an oval car? Well, it wouldn't be like the elbows out depictions that you would see on Hollywood movies about NASCAR, but instead it comes from extreme smoothness and finesse. On many types of ovals, especially intermediates, it is incredibly important to be smooth in both the pedals and the wheel. And this is because the things that matter a lot in those types of tracks are the angle of your car so that you can be proactive to get back on the throttle earlier, and also that your tires never go past the slip angle. This means that too quick of a throttle input will often cause either the right rear to kick out or the right front to plow and cause extreme tire wear and not even gain you any speed. Whereas by smoothly throttling and smoothly braking and smoothly steering, the car can be on a trajectory that allows for everything to wear more evenly and keep as much momentum as possible. A lot of people refer to this type of driving as having an eggshell under the throttle, and that's really what it feels like sometimes and what is required to keep up with some of the best. Another thing that doesn't seem completely obvious to people who are outside of oval racing is just how different turns 1 and 2 are to turns 3 and 4 at pretty much every track. Now don't get me started why turns 1 and 2 are one corner and turns 3 and 4 are another corner, that's a story for a different time. But between these two corners, any nuance between them can make them drive completely differently. So this could be slight banking differences, this could be bumps placed in different areas that make certain lanes worse than others, and this could also just be the shape of them. A very common shape for an oval intermediate track is a tri-oval. Now, in a tri-oval, turns one and two, you enter wide and you exit tight. Whereas in turns three and four, you enter tight and you exit wide. This makes the priorities of each corner really different in how they drive, and they almost never feel similar to each other. A very common mistake to have in an oval race is late in the run when you're worn down, getting tired, your arms are hurting, you just forget which corner you're entering, and then suddenly you've washed halfway up the track and you've lost two positions. <laughs> 
But another side of the community that road racers don't really see in ovals is just how many oval racers race almost exclusively in leagues. It's true, sometimes officials can be a real mess, but leagues you get a more consistent group of people who are usually more interested in racing clean, and if they're not, they get a stern talking to and probably don't show up the next week. And there are a lot of leagues that cater to lower level drivers that see the same amount of cleanliness that a high level league would. And if you're just getting into oval racing, but from other disciplines of racing, I think that a league is a great place to start. And I would recommend my friends and the sponsor of today's video, No Toad Racing League. No Toad Racing League is an establishment in the NASCAR sim racing scene, and they've been around for longer than iRacing themselves. And these days they're recruiting now, and they run races almost every night of the week in all different types of stock cars. The ARCA car, the next gen, the truck, and they're even doing open hosted races for their fixed setup 87 Legend series. So if you want to dip your toes into really good clean league racing without having to commit to something, just search up No Toad and iRacing hosted for their next race. And if you're looking to stick around, use the QR code or the link in the description to join their Discord for more info. And thank you once again to No Toad Racing League for sponsoring this video. Pit strategy and tire strategy is also completely different to what you would see on the road racing side of things because of how different each situation can be when it comes to full course yellows. It's never as simple as, if we pit on this lap it's optimal because of the lap times, and that's because of a lot having to do with how important track position is in stock cars and how much time you really can lose going for a pass or getting arrow blocked by someone. In fact, tire strategy just turns into either a gamble or a big game of chicken in some positions. Do you get the vibe that the race that you're racing in is going to have a lot more cautions? Well then maybe stay out or put on two tires and try to stay in front of some people for track position. Do you think that there's not going to be any more cautions in the race? Well then put four tires on the car and maybe even save and try to get all of your positions at the end of the race. But then if your strategy fails, you end up on the short side of the stick and you could lose the race even being one of the fastest cars out there. I always tell people that oval racing has a lot more natural variance to it and most of that comes from the nature of saving tires and full course yellows. And this is very apparent because you can see on the oval I rating board there's almost no people that are over 10k in the 9k's or even in the 8k's whereas it's very regular for road racers to be up there because their races can be a lot more predictable than oval races. And that's not to say that skill doesn't win out in oval racing, I would venture to say outside of the super speedways, the best driver will win an oval race maybe 8 or 9 times out of 10, but it's those 1 or 2 times out of 10 that really hamper the top level people's eye rating down and make it less of a grind and more of a farm. And the last thing I want to talk about are those super speedway races that I might have had a little bit of a disdainful tone towards earlier in the video. Now personally, I'm not a huge fan of super speedway races, I run them for fun with friends, but it doesn't really do anything for me in terms of serious racing. But that's not to say that there's no skill that goes into super speedway racing. There is actually a lot of skill that goes into it, and you would be shocked at how often the best driver at these skills wins the race. Especially at higher levels, but even at lower levels as well, I consider super speedway racing to be a lot about politics within the race. If you prove to people that you can hold a line, that you're capable of bump drafting, that you're capable of being there at the end to win the race, then people will be more likely to work with you. And then if you're able to bring a couple teammates along the way who will help you no matter what, that's just the cherry on top. But when people ask me for tips at super speedways, I ask them what their goal is. I say, do you want a top 10 or do you want to win? And they say, well, I want to win. And I say, okay, if you want to win, you have to be good with the fact that you're probably going to wreck half the time that you're up there. But it's not easy to win if you're not controlling the front the whole time. If you want to cash in a guaranteed mid top 10, maybe 10th or so, then you can just hang in the back and I'll tell you some tips on how to avoid all the wrecks and not have to worry too much about them. But it's not going to be easy to win the race at the end of the day because you still don't have that track position when you're coming to the finish line, except if the entire field wrecks out and honestly that doesn't happen too often. The ones who can show the field that they know how to bump draft and they can get someone the lead or that they can hold a line and take the lead themselves 
those are the ones who are going to be up there at the end and maybe they're going to be wrecked out but they are in a lot more control over who wins the race than anybody else in the field. So yes, Super Speedway does take skill. And yes, the most skilled person can win the race and probably wins most of the time, but it doesn't guarantee anything. All right, leave a comment below if you have anything about oval racing that still confuses you or you would want some clarity on, or for oval racers, maybe leave in the comments something that you think that other road racers have misconceptions about oval racing. Thanks for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you all on the track.